Hello. Thank you. Welcome back from lunch. My name is uh, Vern Chikalski, and I feel really privileged to be here with you this afternoon. This is my, um, my fifth trip to Prague. Tremendous city, wonderful country, and I'm very happy to be here on behalf of uh, Peter Seidel and the fine staff here at Arc Data. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I've also brought you some nice, warm California weather, too. So I'm enjoying that uh, wonderful weather here. So one of the reasons that we're all here is because of geography. So geography is the foundation for all of the work that we do. Everything happens somewhere for some reason, and geography is that context for where, why, and how those things happen. So as GIS professionals, we think a lot about geography. But thinking about geography isn't as important as turning geography into something more meaningful, something more powerful. Instead of thinking about something, we need to know about something, or we need to understand something. And that's really the science of where. We use GIS and apply it to geography to gain understanding, to gain geographic knowledge. We begin by measuring and collecting data, uh, analyzing data, and then using analysis to understand what's going on. And beyond that, we look at ways to collaborate with others, whether it be others in our organization or whether it be the public. So extending the reach of what we do to a wider audience is also offered to us by this science of where. It's both a framework and a process to turn geography into geographic understanding. So today, many of us that practice GIS are doing so by collecting data, managing that, analyzing it, and applying GIS tools. But oftentimes, we lose sight of the fact that much more than that, GIS is about integrating lots of different types of information. These days, the Internet of Things and sensor networks, as, long, as well as the databases that we work with, need to be integrated and brought together. We also use analytics, computational geography, and also communicate the results of that analytic work in many different ways, and that amplifies it and makes it more important. So today, GIS is not just about collecting and managing data, it's about integrating in analytics and communication, and this is really an entire platform for communicating what we do our geographic knowledge to others. So what brought me to Esri many years ago was a map. I was a biologist and chemist in school, and I've always had a love of maps. And when I moved to California, I discovered Esri when my first career sort of had a meltdown. So I was actually doing um, bone and mineral metabolism research, but I didn't find that very enjoyable. For me, my passion has always been maps and applying computer technology to those maps. So it was a natural fit for me at Esri. And going way, way back, maps have always been one of the building blocks of GIS. Uh, this is from a 1982 user manual for Arc Info, Esri's first product. And even back then, you can see that a geographic information is a set of tools for managing and analyzing maps. A map is the basic unit of information in a GIS, and users work with GIS by applying processes to maps. So maps have been a very important and fundamental building block of everything we do since the very beginning. But maps, of course, have changed quite a lot. This is a very simple map. And uh, back then, we didn't do really complicated things with GIS. A lot of it was just about building databases and managing those databases, building our, our system of, of knowledge. 
Um, but beyond that, we actually didn't ask a lot of hard questions of our GIS because it really couldn't answer them. These days, um, a kind of a new notion is something called a digital twin. And this has emerged over the last few years. Uh, what it really means is that we create a virtual model of our physical world and include processes and systems in that. A digital twin will incorporate multiple sources of information and it's also smart in that it brings in sensors and the Internet of Things. And it allows us to monitor what's going on and more importantly anticipate, solve and mitigate problems before they even occur. So when I first heard of a digital twin, I thought, you know, as GIS people, we've been making digital twins for decades. That's the first thing we do, is we take our city, we take our, our geography, and we turn it into a digital twin in a GIS, and we manage it. Now, Back in the very beginning, the way that we captured a digital twin was very simple. We worked only with points and lines and polygons. So these were very simple ways that we represented the world that we live in and the problems that we had to solve. And because these were so simple, we couldn't really expect a lot out of some of the answers that we would get out of the system. But since then, of course, the way that we capture reality has grown. We have data models, we have parcel fabrics, we have geodesign, we have events, we have networks. All of these things allowed us to capture a more complete and comprehensive digital twin. And add on top of that live feeds and the internet of things and sensors, and we live in a remarkable time where our ability to capture what we need to work with digitally is greater than it's ever been before, which has allowed us to do some really amazing things, and we expect a lot more from our GIS. Today, this might represent our ultimate digital twin. This is ArcGIS Pro, which in many ways reflects where we are. It's the state of the art for a GIS professional. It incorporates data schemas and models and analytics, and it integrates 2D and 3D. This is our modern day digital twin. And because of that, we can move now from simple maps and begin to do much more powerful things. We use maps now to support analysis. And we can do this online, we can do this offline in desktop, but the analysis tools have gotten very, very powerful. And I'm stating the obvious. But what's amazing to me is things that used to take hours or days now happen like that, in an instant almost. I remember um, back in the day working with Arc Info, we would have to run a process called clean on our data sets. And those of you that have been around for a long time might remember that. I'm dating myself now. But um, sometimes that would run for hours. Sometimes that would run for days. And even things like a simple network analysis would be a very long and involved process. So it's amazing to me, to this day, that we can do what we can in the short amount of time using the powerful new capabilities and powerful new technology that GIS runs on. Maps also now support some very critical needs. They support decision-making and also operational awareness so that when events occur, when disasters happen, when hurricanes happen, when good things go bad, we can use a GIS to maintain our situal awareness about what's going on and look at ways to manage that. We also use our GIS maps to support tasks and workflows and also to support field workforces. And many of these technologies has developed into specialized tools. So we have things like Collector for ArcGIS and Survey123, which I know many of you are using very effectively. These are new maps that we work with that empower our workforces and help us do our daily work. 
Now, ArcGIS has evolved along with all the other technologies. Back when I started, the state of the art in terms of hardware was a prime mini computer. And I'm thinking my watch actually has more compute power than that prime mini computer did. And today we have laptops and devices and, and phones that are amazing platforms to experience GIS technology. There's lots of other technologies that have advanced as well. Our ability to collect data through drones and through sensors, innovations in computing infrastructure, those are the things that we at Esri build upon to drive GIS forward. But the most important thing, in my mind, that's happened within the last 10 years is that we've evolved something called WebGIS. So what is WebGIS? Often at conferences I go to, people are still puzzled about what that really means. And they're a little bit afraid. They think, oh, this is revolutionary. Well, it's actually not. It's been evolving for over a decade now. now these are some of my old slides from conferences in the past where we began to see WebGIS emerge and talk about how the internet and, more importantly, services as an architecture would revolutionize what we do and revolutionize our GIS capabilities. So WebGIS isn't so revolutionary. It's definitely evolutionary, and it's still evolving in many, many interesting ways today. So how would I describe WebGIS? Well, one way I would describe it is that it's the heart and soul, it's the foundation of a modern GIS. And simply put, it's just a pattern. It's an architectural approach to implementing a GIS. Now, a lot of people think web means internet, but that's not true. It really means it's powered by services. These services can come from your own infrastructure that your IT department manages, or these services can also come from the cloud. The components of a modern GIS system are all connected by those services. So the maps and the apps we use, the data that's published, they're all services, and this service architecture connects all these things together and allows them to interoperate in many interesting ways. One of the interesting things about WebGIS is you can implement it in the cloud, which is where most people do, but you can also implement it on-premises. So you can use cloud infrastructure or you can use on-premises infrastructure. And what we're seeing more and more is that a modern GIS actually implements elements of both. Now, a long time ago, we used to talk about the five parts of a GIS. And let's see if I can remember this. There was data, there was people, there was um, uh, technology, there was, see, I've forgotten the other two already. Maybe uh, you'll remember what they are. But today, a portal, a destination, a framework for all of our work and where we store and manage all of our maps and, and govern our activities, that's also an essential part of a modern GIS. So what then is a portal? Like I said, it's an essential component now of a modern GIS and some people think of it as a home page, it's really a destination or better yet, it's a framework for managing the data that we have and enabling others to do things with that, to make apps, to make their maps, to take that out in the field and do their work. A portal also manages identity. So when you log in at work, you have an identity. You have a specific job, a specific role that you play in your organization, and a portal manages that. It allows you to collaborate with others, it allows you to access content, and it allows you to access applications to do your work. The portal also manages sharing and collaboration. So you can share just with a small group of others, you can share across your organization, or you can share out to a wider public audience. And the portal manages all that through its framework. Another very important thing that this brings is a new uh, geo-information model. So in the past, we worked with very granular pieces of data, 
right? There were shape files and geodatabases and raster files and, and things like that. One of the great things about a portal in WebGIS is that it has abstracted all of that. And we now just work with maps and layers and apps. Much easier to use, much easier to understand, and this has helped proliferate GIS to many other users and many other departments. And of course, your portal can be implemented in the cloud, ArcGIS Online, or it can be implemented on premises using ArcGIS Enterprise. So there's a couple of ways that you can implement that. But most importantly, your portal represents the center of your geographic information ecosystem, and it allows you to connect and serve many different constituents, the public, decision makers in your organization, other professional GIS users, knowledge workers in other departments. This forms the circle of which you can connect those people. And perhaps even more importantly, it amplifies the importance of the work that you do. So the work that you do is no more important than the abilities for others to appreciate it, the ability for others to learn from it, to gain that same understanding that you've gotten by applying GIS through easy to view and easy to consume ways. That increases the importance of the work that you do by making it more available to others. So I'm focusing a lot on web maps, but that's what I'm really excited about. Maps are what drove me to Esri, and web maps are the new building block of a modern web GIS. And they incorporate that new geo-information model and make it easy for anyone to make their own maps. Back in the day, as GIS people, we thought, we make the maps. Nobody else makes maps. We make the maps. But now anybody can make a map. And they don't have to think about the data sources. They just add layers to a map. And then they can turn that into apps very quickly without any programming. They just take that web map, put it into a configurable app, and they're ready to go. Or they can take it out on their phone or their tablet, and they can take it and use it out in the field. So in many ways, web maps and web GIS have fundamentally changed how we think and how we work as GIS professionals. We're no longer in a tight little closed group. Our mission is to make geographic understanding, our knowledge, and push it out to a wider audience and enable others to work with what we create in many unique and interesting ways. So that's our new mission as GIS people. Web apps are what gets wrapped around that web map and they complete the user experience. They provide specific tools which help people go out in the field and collect data or help people that are using Excel or other office products use the same maps that we do as GIS professionals. At Esri, a web map is much more than a map in the browser. It is actually a technical specification that all of the product teams know about and all of the products are engineered to work with web maps. So they are the lubricant. They are the lingua franca. They are the common foundation communication. The way things work together is all facilitated by web maps. So they're really amazing things. They're simple in many ways, but they're actually really powerful in many more ways. So I've said web GIS is the architecture of a modern GIS, and really the benefits there are that it makes it much easier to use, it makes it much more available and much more accessible, but it also presents to us some challenges. It's a new approach and requires a slightly different way of thinking. Web GIS has enabled us to reach out from our GIS departments and become integrated in the IT world or integrated with the work that other departments do. The role of a GIS professional hasn't diminished. Rather, it's increased in importance because you are powering now the work that many other people in your organization 
do, and you're also empowering greater knowledge and understanding of what's going on with the public and decision makers. So your role is more important now than ever, but it's also different than it used to be. It's changed because of WebGIS. Now, WebGIS empowers all parts of your organization. The initial foundation of GIS was creating a system of record, managing and maintaining your database, the information, the authoritative source of knowledge that you apply to all your tasks. But from there, it's grown out to become a system of insight. So we can apply analytics and models and explore the data and gain insights and knowledge about what we have. And I think most importantly is now we can also reach out and engage others through story maps, through configurable apps, through dashboards. And we can make that knowledge more available to others, which increases our importance as GIS professionals. So the point I'm trying to make is that WebGIS is still evolving. It started a long time ago, but it's still evolving today, and it's driving a digital transformation. It's changing the very nature of how we work. Instead of working in sequential workflows, we now have a lot of people working at once, sometimes on the same problem, sometimes on different problems, but those can be brought together to gain even newer insight and understanding. So this represents a transformation that's been going on for a while, but is continuing to grow, and we continue to adapt and leverage it as we move on from here. So how do you implement a web GIS? Well, the key elements these days are ArcGIS Pro. It was designed from the ground up to support web GIS. Unlike ArcMap, ArcMap integrates with WebGIS, but ArcGIS Pro was designed from the ground up to be both a client and a publisher to participate in this WebGIS environment. And also, you need to have something that drives those services, and you have two choices. There's ArcGIS Online and also ArcGIS Enterprise, which is your own services, your own servers on your own hardware, on your own architecture, back behind your own firewall. So let's take a look at uh, how we can evolve that. And most people do it in stepwise fashion. This might represent what you have today, ArcGIS desktop, some data, and maybe a server. To enable that, to web enable that, to turn that into a web GIS, you can just register those services in ArcGIS Online. Or begin by publishing from desktop directly into ArcGIS Online. You're creating reusable layers that people can assemble into maps and then create apps from. Another alternative is to use ArcGIS Enterprise. In this case, you want to bring it onto your own infrastructure, behind your own firewall. Perhaps you have requirements from your IT department. This is another architecture, but most people that do this also leave that open to connect up to the rest of the ArcGIS online universe, all the other maps and apps that are shared out there, and of course, all of the content, the base maps, and other layers from the living atlas that you can leverage. So it doesn't really make any matter where you implement this. Another pattern is that if you're implementing ArcGIS Enterprise, many of those users are also implementing part of what they do in the public cloud. And we are evolving tools that help us synchronize and back up and send data, layers, information back and forth and manage these two environments. So this is an area where we see continued growth and continued interest. And how you implement your GIS is really driven by your needs and by your capabilities. So WebGIS has turned maps into not just these simple things that we often just printed on paper. It's turned maps into something really more powerful and changed the way that we think about it. So one of the things that WebGIS has changed here is it's made maps smarter. So this is a system, and we're looking at a map, that was built by the Indiana State Police Department. And what it does is it uses um, 
models, algorithms, intelligence that's gathered all the time from accidents. So we uh, get information about the accidents, where they happen, where the sun was, what time of day it was, how far away from other businesses it was, like restaurants or bars. Also, where people work, where the, uh, the, their common traffic patterns go. All this knowledge is built into this map on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can use it to predict hours ahead what traffic will be, and the police use this to identify where they need to put more patrols, and the public is beginning to use this to even change their driving patterns, so they avoid places where there's a high potential of accidents during certain times of the day. Another thing is that maps are getting much, much more powerful. Now, what you're looking at here is over a million features in this one single web map. So this used to be impossible to do. Now it's very possible through the evolution of our JavaScript API, the underpinnings for the applications that we deliver. And what we're looking at is the history of buildings that are built in the greater New York City area. So on the lower left, you'll see the date go by. You'll see that little slider move across. And the current buildings for that date are highlighted in light blue. And then as we drift away from that date, they're shaded towards purple. But we're looking at and accessing information from over a million features in one web map. Maps are also becoming more connected. The New York City, the city publishes an open data site, and part of what they publish there are a lot of their sensor feeds. So these are what's going on with traffic. These are um, traffic cameras. These are where accidents occur. These are where bicycles are, are hit by cars. Everything that's going on in the city is captured in this map through the Internet of Things, this vast sensor network. And we can explore this in our map, and we can manage this real-time information in this modern-day web GIS map. So here we're looking at uh, traffic patterns. We're looking at uh, what's going on. We can also connect to the traffic cameras and look at the live cameras and view the traffic as it's streaming from those cameras moving along the streets in our cities. So this is much different than what we used to be able to do and much more powerful. Another thing is that our maps are becoming increasingly more realistic. Our digital twins are being captured with more realism and accuracy than ever. Now, this is a 3D city. This is the city of Philadelphia near my hometown, and this is using pictometry to grab the actual building facades and paint them on the sides of these 3D models. Maps are also going indoors. BIM, Building Information Management, is a highly and rapidly growing topic of interest. And uh, this is from the University of Kentucky. And they use GIS to manage infrastructure within their buildings. Everything from chairs and desks to the infrastructure that's running through the building is managed indoors through GIS and maps. But maps are also going underground. Here we're looking at a city and we can go below the surface and look at the pipelines, the utilities that connect our water, our power, and service all of our buildings and what's going on in the cities. So within buildings and below ground, we're using GIS to expand our capabilities there. Story maps are, I think, one of the most fun and certainly one of the most popular uses of GIS maps these days. They incorporate videos and, and charts and text and, of course, maps. Uh, here we're looking at a story map about av avalanches in Switzerland, and this story map is, is not just static text. It's actually a live map that we can explore. So as the information in this map is being updated, the story map will automatically be displaying the latest information about what's going on. And there's hundreds of thousands of these story maps now. Another way that we're using web maps is to drive policy and to engage a larger community. So this is the city of Los Angeles' website. They've also implemented open data. And this allows entrepreneurs or developers to access the city data and continue that forward, do other interesting things with it. This is actually a hub. 
and a hub is a new solution. It's actually a new concept. And a hub contains what are called initiatives. An initiative is something that you want to do. And we can engage the public to help us accomplish something. In this case, the city of Los Angeles is trying to reduce uh, traffic fatalities in the city, pedestrians being hit by cars, and they're engaging the public with apps so the public can participate and record information and contribute that back to the data. And really interesting is that maps are taking us to places that we've never been. So this is one of my colleagues. He's uh, got the um, the virtual reality goggles on, and he's in one of our conference rooms, and if you look at the laptop to the lower right, that's what he's seeing. He's actually walking and engaging with a virtual model of a city, and he can look up and he can see building tops, he can uh, look at trees and walk down the street. What he has in his hand are little, um, little controls, and he can point to a target and he can kind of beam himself there like we were uh, like on uh, you know uh, en enterprise you know we were we we're Dr. Spock or Captain Kirk beaming ourselves uh, to a new location so that's what those little paddles are used for is to move us around in this virtual model so I think this is the future of where maps and where a lot of our work will go is to experience things virtually not only because that's neat, but because this is a great way to look at planning, redevelopment, and the impacts of different options that we might have. So, maps have certainly evolved. What I'd like to do is transition here just a little bit and talk about our work, Esri's work, and how our focus is on creating useful technology and supporting you. So, there's lots going on. Esri is a very large company now. Um, when I started, there were about 100 people. We had two products. Now we have 3, 000, over 3,000 people at our company headquarters and thousands more distributed across the world. We have R&D centers in Zurich and in Portland and Australia. So Esri's grown to be quite a large company, and as a result, there's lots of things happening all at the same time. These represent just a few of the focus areas that we're working on. This is constant motion here. We're working on artificial intelligence and deep learning tools. We're working on advanced analytics and advanced visualization, improving smart mapping. We're looking to leverage containerization for our server-side capabilities, and we're evolving new products like Insights for ArcGIS to help reach an entirely different community of users. Now, ArcGIS Pro, as I mentioned earlier, is the flagship desktop for professional GIS users. And it's evolving in many different ways. It includes advanced mapping, management, visualization, editing and analysis all in one. It's a very large and very comprehensive software product. And I know most of you use ArcGIS desktop in your work every day. Now, I think a lot of you use ArcMap. And as I mentioned earlier, ArcMap connects to WebGIS, but ArcGIS Pro was designed up to be an integral and integrated part of WebGIS. So it took me a long time to make the transition from ArcMap to ArcGIS Pro, but what I discovered along the way is there are so many more things that you can do in Pro, and there are so many things that are so much easier in Pro than with ArcMap that um, once I crossed that divide, crossed that barrier, I knew I was not going back. So I encourage all of you, if you're still using ArcMap, to really think to migrate to ArcGIS Pro. We'll, of course, continue to support ArcMap for years and years to come, but there are so many advantages to moving to Pro. I encourage all of you to begin moving in that direction if you haven't adopted it already. Now, another thing we've been working on recently is the integration of Autodesk with ArcGIS. So now you can look at Autodesk models at, at Revit in ArcGIS Pro, and also as an Autodesk user, you can leverage ArcGIS capabilities in your environment. So this represents more than just a marriage of technologies. It actually represents maybe two communities coming together as one and allowing us to do some really 
interesting things. Another area that we focused on is data management. And one of the areas that we've applied some focus to is in utility data management. And here to show us how that works, please welcome Mark. Thank you, Bernie, and uh, a vám všem uh, dobré odpoledne. Uh, Argis Utility Network Management Extension je nový framework uh, pro práci uh, s utilitními s inženýrskými sítěmi v prostředí Argis. Zde vidíme příklad uh, inženýrské sítě, jedná se o distribuční síť elektrické energie uh, někde v oblasti Chicaga. Jednou z významných vlastností uh, Utility Network je to, že se jedná o architekturu postavenou na službách Argis serveru. To umožňuje pracovat s inženýrskou sítí v rámci celé uh, platformy Argis, nejen z těžkého klienta. Takže i vaše mobilní klient, vaši mobilní klienti budou mít nativní nástroje pro práci s inženýrskou sítí. Tady se můžeme podívat na další pohled, na nějakou bližší oblast, jak inženýrská síť může vypadat. Další z významných vlastností nové inženýrské sítě je to, že umožňuje pokročilé modelování složitých síťových prvků a jejich vazeb. Já si teď přepnu a podívám se na jeden z transformátorů, které v této distribuční síti mám. A jedná se ve skutečnosti o soustavu tří z transformátorů, které jsou... Přepnu si na správnou, správný nástroj, už jsem si tam dal teda trasovací znamenko, které teď v tuhle chvíli nechci. A podívám se na tady ten transformátor. Jak jsem říkal, jedná se o soustavu tří transformátorů, které jsou umístěny na sloupu elektrického napětí. Vidíme, že tady vede vedení středně, středního napětí a je tady vedení nízkého napětí. Takže tohle všechno je mezi sebou propojené. Ten transformátor mám zobrazený jako jeden prvek. Já ale ve skutečnosti vím, že je složený z několika prvků a ty prvky si můžu zobrazit. Tady vidíme, z jakých částí se transformátor skládá. I když tento transformátor, to vedení i elektrický sloup nejsou přesně na sebe, nezdílí žádný geometrický bod, přesto mezi nimi existuje konektivita. Tuhle já si můžu také zobrazit jako grafiku v mapě a můžu se podívat na to, jak jsou ta data propojené. propojená. Že ta data jsou propojená, si můžu ověřit tím, že začnu trasovat. Bude mi v tuhle chvíli například zajímat, odkud je napájeno toto vedení nízkého napětí. Takže si tam umístím značku, že odsud chci trasovat a budu trasovat proti směru, abych se dostal, odkud je tato, toto vedení napájeno. Je tady předkonfigurováno spoustu trasovacích úloh, které vám můžou usnadnit vaši práci, ale když se podíváte na prostředí pro trasování, na ten nástroj, tak vidíte, že je tam spoustu parametrů, které si můžete volit. Takže máte velkou kontrolu nad tím, jak ta data můžete procházet a jak s nimi můžete pracovat. Můžete si také připravit nástroje, kde vaši uživatelé jenom kliknou na tračítko a vytrasuje se jim přesně ta daná operace, kterou budou chtít. Tak. Ještě jsem tam nezadal ty, těch pár parametrů, které je tam potřeba mít, takže si nastavím, zkontroluji i filtry, že mám průchodnost nastavenou tak, jak chci a spustím nástroj pro trasování. A můžu se podívat na výsledky trasování, kam mě to všechno vytrasovalo. Vidím, že od toho svého vedení, které mě zajímalo, se dostanu trasováním až někam sem, což je v jižní, v jižní oblasti nějaká distribuční stanice, ze, kterého, ze které je dané vedení napájeno. Takže modelování složitých zařízení, modelování vazeb mezi nimi, nemusí být ta data přímo geometricky propojena, ale ty vazby můžete nastavit, 
Architektura založená na službách, která vám umožňuje práci napříč celou platformou Argis za použití natívných nástrojů. Nová architektura verzovacího modelu pro rychlejší a výkonnější práci s inženýrskými sítěmi. To je vše, co nám nová utilitní síť nabízí. Nebo ne vše, je to jedna z těch velkých předností, kterých můžete využít. Pokud vás blíže zajímají inženýrské sítě a práce s nimi, tak na toto téma budu mít i vystoupení v našem minikeně, v, našem minikeně v, nám, v rámci našich programů a rád vás tam přivítám a zodpovím vás, vám další otázky, které na toto, na toto téma budete mít. Děkuji za pozornost a back to you, Bernie. Okay, thank you, Mark. Now the next product I'd like to turn to is ArcGIS Enterprise. And this is how you implement WebGIS on-premises. There's been lots of activity here. We've improved the tools that you use to install it and maintain it, so it's easier to do that. We've increased its capabilities in terms of analytics. And there's a series of extensions that are available for this, like the geo event tracking server and the advanced analytic server. These things plug into this environment and they make this a very powerful and complete on premises infrastructure to implement your GIS. Now, something new that we just uh, produced here is something called sites. These are microsites and it represents a focused destination for members of your organization to go to to get at the maps and the apps and the tools that they need. These sites will also be coming to ArcGIS Online, but they've appeared here in ArcGIS Enterprise first. The same is also true with Python Notebook. So we're supporting that both on-premises in ArcGIS Enterprise as well as in the cloud with ArcGIS Online. And uh, we're also evolving currently our ability to take this infrastructure and containerize that to make it more redundant, to make it more scalable, and to also make it more fault um, tolerant. So that's ArcGIS Enterprise, but for most of us, ArcGIS Online is what powers our web GIS, and this is growing amazingly rapidly. Now we have over six million users of this system. It's producing hundreds of millions of maps a day. There's 45,000 new maps that are authored and shared every day. 6,500 new users are entering this system every day. And it handles anywhere from 2,500 to 10,000 requests per second. If there's any doubt that this isn't a robust architecture, those facts and figures uh, certainly uh, would demonstrate that it indeed is. And it is evolving. Um, we do about three, usually four releases of year. These are incremental releases that introduce new capabilities and um, some new tools that you can use. We've, we continually improve things like smart mapping and analytics, our configurable apps and web maps, but we're looking forward to include other capabilities, better integration with the Internet of Things, um, hosted Python notebooks, and we're also uh, continuing to evolve our hosted analytic capabilities. These are really interesting because a lot of these tools like buffering and data enrichment and aggregating and all of these tools used to be the domain of GIS professionals only. You could only use them in desktop GIS, but now these are available in the cloud so more people can leverage these. And they're presented in much more familiar and easier to use ways. Again, not diminishing the role of a GIS professional, but enabling and spreading the capabilities of GIS to a whole new audience. Now, one thing that we've just finished uh, working on back um, behind the scenes in Redlands that we'll be introducing next month is new role-based 
or user type based business model. So those of you that are familiar with the current business model know that we license this in two levels. Level one for view only uh, people and level two is everybody else. Now, what we've done is listen to the needs of the community and what they've insisted upon is that we think about licensing based on who the user is in the organization and what capabilities they need and what apps they need to accomplish their work. So one way I think of this is if we weren't GIS people but actually ran a restaurant, how does that work? Well, the chef, he does sort of everything, right? and he commands uh, others within the kitchen to do their work. The baker, he's responsible for the breads and the cakes, and the sous chef is responsible for the sauces and so forth. So each of these has a different role in our restaurant, and they use different tools to accomplish their task. And that's the same way that it works with this new role-based model. And we envision five different uh, roles here, a viewer, so that's a view only access to information. Editors who can edit data, field workers, creators, and a GIS professional. And all of these are um, work with different apps and work with different capabilities. So this is something new that you'll begin hearing more about over the next weeks. And we'll be rolling out with the next release of ArcGIS Online and subsequently ArcGIS Enterprise, which will start about the second week in December. So this is, this is some new capabilities. Now we focus also a lot on ArcGIS content. We think of content as a fundamental part of the platform. And this of course is the living atlas. It's base maps, it's thematic data of all different types, it's elevation, it's hydrography. More and more of that is becoming live, real-time feeds, and more and more of it is becoming predictive. So some of the models are being applied so you can do things like look at what water flow will be over the next day or two days or three days or even more. So this is continuing to evolve, and we've added some really interesting things here. Uh, we've been evolving the concept of vector base maps. Instead of raster tiles, which have to be pre-rendered, now it's all based on vectors and the tiles are dynamically rendered on the fly, which opens up some really interesting possibilities, which I'll show you. You can edit those using a tool, still in beta, that's called the Vector Tile Style Editor. We also incorporated the Sentinel-2 imagery from the European Space Agency, and that's two satellites that continue to revolve around the Earth. Each spot on the planet is revisited every five days. So this provides a dynamic source of imagery to see what's going on in our, our planet. And also something called Wayback. What I'd like to do here real quickly is just show some of these things. So this is Wayback. It's an application which allows you to search our imagery archives and look for different dates. So here's all the different dates that imagery has been collected. The ones with the white highlight are where there's been some change detected. And I can kind of filter just based on those. So you can see as I mouse over that we can see change occurring in that imagery. I can use these layers to make a new web map and that's what I've done here. So this is a business district not far from where we are today. Uh, here I believe a little further south. And this is what it looks like now, but using that way back, I've captured imagery at different intervals of time going back about four years and I can go forwards and backwards and I can see how things have changed in that area. Another thing that we've worked on is those vector base maps. The default base map is this one, the world topographic base map, but we've introduced many other types. The first is actually not a vector base map, but is actually a raster uh, base map. And this is something called World Imagery Firefly. And what it does is it uses the imagery, but when you're zoomed out, it's grayscale. You still get the drama and the texture of the imagery, but it's muted colors and it's excellent for using something we call firefly symbols, little glowing symbols, and it makes them pop on this map. But of course, when we zoom in, let's zoom in here to Prague, you'll see that the imagery becomes more colorized. So as we zoom in, 
it finally reaches the full colorization of the world uh, imagery, which you'll see here in just a moment. Internet be with us. There we go. So you can see the, the rich color of the imagery here, so it's moved from grayscale to this. On top of that, we've created vector base maps that can be looked at in a variety of different styles. Here's a style I really like. This is called newspaper. This is the same vector data, but is styled differently. This is something called mid-century. You can see the text is different, the color is different. Uh, here's the world street map at night, meant for night navigation. And here's another treatment called Nova. And that's the really powerful part of these vector base maps. Using the vector tile style editor, which I'm showing you here, you can take any of these maps or any of your other vector tiles and you can edit them. So for example, uh, in this case, I'll just do something simple. I'll change the color of those blue streets and uh, let's make it a little bit red here and we'll go ahead and apply that color. So you can see we're applying a new color schema to that map. So instead of the blue streets, we now have these maroon streets and you can customize this to suit your needs or to make your own brand of, uh, of base map. So this will be coming soon. So the Living Atlas is full of content that Esri curates and we focus on global content. Many of you, of course, use all of our base maps. These new vector base maps represent some interesting things for you to use as well, but more importantly, you, all of you, can contribute to the Living Atlas because one of its goals is to be a community GIS. So you can contribute, say, your imagery to the World Imagery Service, and we'll sew that in seamlessly and it'll be published as part of our imagery base map. Or you can contribute other content to the Living Atlas. You can contribute your maps, your layers, or even your apps and story maps. So an interesting thing that's happening here is that ArcData is actually taking a lead on helping you contribute to improving the Living Atlas here in this country, here to show us how that will work. Please welcome Silva. Here, Silva. Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Dovolte, abych nyní navázala na Bernieho v tématu Living Atlas. Mnozí z vás ukládáte svá data, svůj mapový obsah na Argis Online. Pomocí portálu Argis Online tato data zpravujete a sdílíte. Sdílíte buď jen se svými kolegy, anebo veřejně. Díky tomu je každému k dispozici na Argis Online obrovské množství veřejně dostupných položek, ve kterých je sice možné vyhledávat pomocí klíčových slov, ale tento obsah není nijak strukturován. Living Atlas je podmnožinou tohoto veřejného obsahu Argis Online. Patří sem právě jen ty položky, které jsou pečlivě kontrolovány, důsledně opatřeny metadaty a zařazeny do kategorií, aby byly strukturovány. Díky tomu můžeme na Living Atlas vyhledávat snadno a na data, která zde najdeme, se můžeme spolehnout. Podívejme se nyní na to, jak můžeme s Living Atlas pracovat a co v něm můžeme v tuto chvíli najít pro území naší republiky. Zjišťu, že mi nefunguje myš. Pardon. Můžu poprosit režii o pomoc? Už ji mám. Dobrý. <laughs> tak, děkuju. <laughs> tak, čili, pro, pro ty z vás, kdo se pohybujete v prostředí Argis Online, na portálu argis.com, je nejpřímější cesta do Living Atlas přes záložku obsah, kde můžete vidět kromě položek svého obsahu také další záložku Living Atlas 
A tady se díváme na kompletní Living Atlas. Pro celý svět je tu k dispozici přes 7 000 položek, které jsou dále kategorizovány do různých kategorií, jak tady vidíme, třeba tu máme kategorii lidé a celou řadu dalších podkategorií můžu zvolit třeba povolání a tak dále. Většinu z vás ale nyní bude spíše zajímat ten obsah, ty položky, které se stahují k území České republiky. Čili vyberu ze seznamu států Českou republiku a vidím, že Living Atlas pro Českou republiku aktuálně obsahuje 32 položek, které můžu různým způsobem třídit a odsud prohlížet, můžu si, můžu si něco dozvědět o podrobnostech té položce, která mě zajímá, a nebo na ní jednoduše kliknu a ona se mi přímo zobrazí v mapovém prohlížeči ve viewru Argis Online. V tuto chvíli mám k dispozici geologickou mapu 1,5 milionu, která je mi k dispozici jak se svou legendou, tak se svojí kompletní atributovou tabulkou. Jestliže kliknu do mapy, dozvídám se k příslušnému prvku výpis z atributové tabulky. Další způsob, jak mohu pracovat s položkami z Living Atlas, je přidávat je rovnou do mapy. Čili přes tlačítko Přidat, vyhledávat vrstvy. A zde zvolím nikoliv na Argis Online, jak jste už nejspíše zvyklí, ale na Living Atlas. Načtou se mi veškeré položky Living Atlas, mohla bych v nich zase dále filtrovat a seřazovat. Všechny tyto položky jsou opatřeny modrým emblémem modrého globu, takže je tak poznáte i mezi obsahem Argis Online. Nás teď ale zajímá ta Česká republika, takže si opět vymezíme Českou republiku a mohu se tady probírat tím, co je zde už k dispozici. Opět jsou tu ty webové vrstvy a vidím, že jsou tu od Měměřického úřadu například tři položky, která se stahují k výškopisu. Abych si mohla vybrat tu, kterou právě potřebuju, budu si potřebovat možná přečíst nějaké informace o ní, nějaký popis. Nebo se rozhodnu, že nebudu pracovat s výškopisnými daty, ale zaměřím se na půdy. Takže zkusím klíčové slovo půdy a Living Atlas mi nabídne vrstvu bonitačních půdně ekologických jednotek od státního pozemkového úřadu. Já si ji přidám do mapy a vidím, že tu mám vykreslené ty jednotky a jejich popisky s jejich kódem. Jestliže na některou z jednotek kliknu, dozvídám se navíc její výměru a mohu porovnat s výpisem z geologické mapy pro stejné území. Ještě si mohu pomocí Living Atlas změnit podkladovou mapu, takže zase pomocí, pomocí kategorií se podívám, jaké podkladové mapy mám pro Českou republiku k dispozici. Od zeměněnického úřadu mohu zvolit ZM10 a já zvolím třeba tuto, toto ortofoto. Čili tímto způsobem může kdokoliv na světě vytvářet webové mapy z dat, která jsou sdílena ESRI komunitou. Living Atlas je tedy důvěrohodným zdrojem dat pro celou uživatelskou komunitu. Teď ještě si pověsme, kdo a jak může do Living Atlas přispívat. Přispěvatelem do Living Atlas rozhodně není jenom společnost ESRI. Může to být každý z vás, ovšem to přispění se děje pod taktovkou kurátora Living Atlas. Je to jednoduché, stačí přejít na stránku livingatlas.argis.com, což můžete učinit například pomocí tohoto tlačítka. A dostanete se tedy na stránku věnovanou Living Atlas, kde po překliknutí na záložku My Contributions uvidíte položky ve svém obsahu. V mém případě je to přispěvatelský účet ArcData a jsou zde vrstvy administrativního členění z databáze ArcČR500. Já mohu vidět, že jsou tu položky, které už byly do Living Atlas nominovány, položky, které už byly dokonce kurátorem akceptovány 
A pak je tu položka, kterou bych chtěla nominovat, ale zatím nominována nebyla a ani to není možné, protože nejprve je třeba splnit několik náležitostí, což ovšem není vůbec složité. Je tady k dispozici nakliknutí nějaký názorný průvodce, nicméně to uživatelské rozhraní člověka samo vede a vidíte, že tady bych mohla například doplnit nějaká klíčová slova, že tady mám nějaký červený vykřičník, který mě upozorňuje, že ta položka musí být veřejná, hned to tedy napravím a nastavím její sdílení na veřejné. A to mi zlepšilo bodové skóre natolik, že mohu tuto položku nyní nominovat. Pokud kurátor tuto položku akceptuje, budu se moci těšit z toho, že jsem přispěla na Living Atlas a uživatelé budou moci snadno tuto položku vyhledat a s důvěrou využít. Jako poskytovatel mohu tato data kdykoliv aktualizovat průběžně nebo mohu položku odstranit a nahradit jinou. Na závěr bych chtěla poděkovat všem těm, kdo do Living Atlas již přispěli, a chtěla bych pozbudit další z vás, kdo byste měli čím přispět, abyste tak učinili, aby se Living Atlas stal skutečně živým atlasem, který bude přinášet užitek celé uživatelské komunitě. Děkuji za pozornost. Okay, so I'm sure you're all excited about the, the new things that will appear in the Living Atlas and I encourage you to stay tuned with ARC data here uh, to help contribute to that. So for us, for Esri, the road ahead continues on from here. Our goals are that we will continue to do incremental software releases for things like ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Pro, and online we'll continue those multiple releases per year and keep evolving that platform. Uh, you see lots of words on this slide which, again, underscore some of our focus areas for what we're working on right now and what we hope to be able to deliver to you in the near future. Our focus, as always, is on quality, is on performance, and also innovating as new innovations apply in the rest of the technology sphere. So, in closing, what I'd like to do is suggest that we as GIS professionals have a lot to think about. With all these new capabilities, with all of these changes, all of these, these new things happening at an exponential rate, it's really a challenge for us to keep up with these, but that is part of what we need to do as GIS professionals. Now, my science teacher used to tell me that science will save us. And I think as we approach some of these bigger problems, not just within our communities, but within society as a whole or the world as a whole, with climate change and preserving uh, space for species and things like that, that the science of where is what ultimately will be able to save us. So as you think about these things, I encourage you to think about what's possible. Think about transitioning what you do into new areas. Think about taking existing workflows that you have and leveraging new apps and new capabilities to improve those workflows. Think about not just going through a digital transition, but think about going through a digital transformation that WebGIS affords us. So I encourage you to not just imagine the possibilities, but to reimagine what's possible. Thank you very much.